Hi, I'm Bill Kelly on the way to the French islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon. Tonight we're going to show you the two St. Pierre's, the one the tourists flock to during the summer and the one a hardy breed of Frenchmen has called home for hundreds of years. The ferry is blocked. As you'd expect, many Newfoundlanders are aboard, but there are also a lot of mainlanders and a good few Americans too. Ordinarily, many of these people, especially the Americans, would be visiting Europe, but all the terrorism over there, the bombings and the hijackings, have scared them off. Oh, there's a number of factors, including the value of the dollar. They decided on Canada this year. How about ter terrorism over there? Well, that played some part. Uh -huh. Not a major part, I guess. No, I wouldn't say the major part, no. When we were making plans, though, all of that started happening. Yeah. And so that it did play some role at that time. Now, I don't know, it seems that things are under control again. But in the meantime, we had made our plans. Out of the sunshine, into the fog. The weather changes quickly down here on the south coast. Oh well, look on the bright side. A bit of fog means a smoother crossing. We're getting close to land now. Out come the cameras again. Tourists are the same all over. They love their cameras. The tourist brochures call St. Pierre a little piece of Europe close to home. So get ready now, you're about to set foot on foreign soil. These brochures are right. This is every bit as French as France itself. From the narrow winding streets to the wild, reckless drivers. Watch it, folks. This is one place you've got to look before you step off the curb. All the drivers around here must think they're in the St. Pierre Grand Prix. There are a few stop signs, and if there are any speed limits, nobody pays attention. Oh, Lord, look at this. Ladies, please stay on your own side. You're in mortal danger. Now, if you dodge the traffic, you'll wind up in the shopping district. But forget your Kmarts and Zellers. Remember, this is St. Pierre, a place that adds a whole new dimension to the Newfoundland General Store. Take this shop, for instance. Here you'll find St. Pierre's widest assortment of French chocolates and candy. They even have little gift boxes of candy for new babies. Cute, aren't they? But right next to them, are you ready for this, is the island's largest selection of funeral flowers and wreaths. If by chance the shopkeeper doesn't have something you're looking for, she'll tell you where to get it. No, the, um... You see something else you want? <laughs> Do you have the uh, St. Pierre Michelin flag? No, that's not. No, no flag. No, they are the only one uh, shop. You know, you go to the right this way, and you see Hotel Ile de France, and you go up, you know, and oh. uh, the Spaturel. Spaturel. Many tourists aren't used to this kind of personal treatment. They love it. Good morning. How are you enjoying St. Pierre? Very well indeed. Where, where are you uh, people from? Ontario. Elliott Lake in particular, northern Ontario. The uranium belt. The uranium belt. The uranium capital of the world. Uh -huh. What do you think of uh, St. Pierre? Very, very hilly. Up and down. Streets are narrow. We stayed in a, in a house here. Uh, they call it Marcel uh, Hillen. Oh, yeah? and uh, very friendly, very good accommodation. And uh, if we come back again, I think we'll try to get the same place. So from Kalamazoo, Michigan? Kalamazoo, Michigan. Right. That's near where? Chicago, Detroit. It's about halfway between Chicago and Detroit. How are you enjoying it? 
I love it. Yeah? I love it. I'm, I'm really a, a frustrated Canadian. Oh, yeah? Well, <laughs> happy to hear that. How about you, ma'am? Are you from Canada? I'm from Nanaimo, Vancouver Island, Canada. Ah, terrific. So well, what brings you here? Um, a convention in St. John's. Oh, and a couple of days away, huh? That's right. Great. To great. see the French islands. Are you enjoying yes. it? Oh, very much. Terrific. So you're shopping this morning? Yes. Well, yes. it won't hold you up too much longer. Okay. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Merci. 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 See you later. Have a good trip I, back. If you don't show this on the West Coast, I'm going to have your throat. <laughs> I'm going to send a poison pen letter to CBC. They have this thread on film. You can't back up. See you later. Thanks again. Have a good trip back. A few years ago, a trip to St. Pierre used to be as cheap as dirt. Not anymore. You can still get a deal on a few items like cigarettes, perfumes, and silk scarves. And of course, you can get a great deal on cognac. All liquor, for that matter. But most things have gone up a lot. The French really revel in their food. Eating supper around here is an event. It lasts most of the night. Now to us, buffet style is totally acceptable. But to the French, this hotel's practice is pure heresy. The tourists like it though, and they still have a choice of going to any number of other good restaurants for a sit-down meal. Later, at the disco, much later in fact, it was about four o'clock in the morning, a Portuguese sailor steals the show. He thinks he's John Travolta. But the lovely lady steals his heart. Romeo actually proposed marriage. Honest to God, he did. Juliet politely declined, we think. So much for the tourist haven. When we return, the real Saint-Pierre, a closely knit community that revolves around the water. St. Pierre is a place that lives or dies by the fishery. And like Newfoundland, there have been prosperous times and very lean times too. Again, like our province, the sea has taken a very steep toll here. The place we're standing in right now is not a war memorial. It was erected by the French government as a memorial to all the fishermen here who have died over the years. <laughs> The fishery is Saint Pierre's raison d'etre, its reason for being, and in some ways, it's still a remote fishing outpost. Many Newfoundlanders will recognize the old-fashioned capstan. And this is Rennie Lewberry, a fisherman who carries on in the tradition of his forefathers. Blueberry fishes alone in his distinctive St. Pierre dory. Other than the motor, the boat is no different than his ancestors would have used 300 years ago.
The water is as smooth as glass in the harbor, but it won't stay that way very long. Take a good look at the dory while you can. The people here tell us these boats won't be around much longer. There are only a handful of fishermen like Blueberry left, and not a single dory has been built in the past five years. These guys haven't made any money in a long time, and we're told if it weren't for the island's elaborate social security system, a setup even more generous than our UIC, fishermen like Blueberry simply couldn't survive. An average catch for one of these dories used to be about 3,000 pounds a day. A big day now? About 200 pounds. It hasn't been as bad as this around here since the early 1900s, when the fishery failed four years in a row. Many settlers at that time beat it back to France. The population was cut in half, from 10,000 to only 6,000. It's never really recovered. That, of course, was before Louberry's time. He grew up in the heyday of the salt fish trade, a time when Saint-Pierre really did well, a time when the whole family made a living off the fishery. The men did the fishing, of course, but like their neighbors in Newfoundland, the women worked hard too. So did the kids even the animals. But those days are gone forever. Today, Rennie Lewberry deals with a much grimmer reality. No fish today? No. No fish at all, eh? Same as old. Is that right, eh? Very much old. No, no good fish. The whole summer has been a write-off? Oh, the, no fish, eh? Uh-huh. Okay. The strain shows. In English or French, nothing is still nothing. These days, most of the fish is cut offshore and brought here to the plant, the island's principal employer. Just outside at the wharf, another dragger is being unloaded. We're told these boats are doing really well, that without them the plant would be out of business. The plant itself is just like the ones you'd find here in Newfoundland. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all. Well, not quite. The Europeans have always been more resourceful than ourselves in stretching the lowly codfish, in making it go further. Over here, they're just as ingenious. After they finish with the fillets, the workers at this plant take the leftovers, the stuff we'd normally throw to the gulls, and turn them into a vacuum-packed soup. A very popular soup in France. We decided to try it for ourselves. No, no, it's fine. Fine, girl. No. Fine. Just smells cheese is good. Mm. What's that? that piece? No, no, it's fine, girl. What? Okay. Same. It's different. It's different. 
It didn't particularly suit our palate, but then again, the French don't exactly jump up and down over our flipper pie. Since we're on the subject of innovation, let's drop in here. No, really, it's much more exciting than it looks. This salt cod is destined for the European market, mainly Spain and Portugal. It's pretty standard fare, we admit, but wait until we show you some of the other things they're doing here. Now, what about a guy like you? The owner, Andre Guerron, is a bit of a renegade. He probably drives the bureaucrats crazy. But he's also a dreamer, a visionary, perhaps a touch ahead of his time. No, not really, because... Guerron, there are products here that I don't even recognize. Can you tell us what they are? No, well, those are fish sounds, cod sounds, to be exact. And they are dried out, and we're sending it to Asia. Hong Kong, Taiwan. Hong Kong, Taiwan. Big market for those things? Well, no, there is not a big market, but, uh, you know, it's a delicacy, and uh, some uh, some firms just uh, like to have it on their, in their stuff. So, uh, Excuse my ignorance, but well, how, would you, uh, how would you eat those? Those are rehydrated mm -hmm. uh, and uh, cut up in pieces, mm -hmm. steamed, right. and added to uh, Chinese soup. Oh, I see. Now, these look like cod's heads. They are cut heads. Uh, we take the uh, upper jaw off, mm -hmm. and we have here the uh, cheeks mm -hmm. and the tongue, you see? Right. And that's for uh, Portuguese market. Oh, I see. Yeah. I take it your philosophy is to use every piece of the cod, well, a lot more than we're using. The, the, the cod is uh, the pig of the sea, you know, and you can use everything. I mean, the sounds, you can use the, the heads, mm -hmm. the liver. Mm -hmm. The stomach, which we be a grip. Well, hang on. Now, what? Who, who wants stomachs? Well, the Chinese. Yeah? The Chinese want stomach. They rehydrate them, stuff them with mushrooms and bits of shrimps and things like that, and cut them in slices. Oh, I see. When these are cooked, they get bigger, is that it? Oh, yes. They swell up. What? They swell up again. Now, can you get the fishermen to deliver these to you? <laughs> no, because nobody really believes it, because they, they figure that... Uh, it's uh, no good for their palate, so it wouldn't be any good for anybody else's palate. Right. But uh, you see, my, I think that uh, we export uh, camembert cheese, eh, which is, uh, to an Asian, disgusting. Eh? But that we have no problem for export. And this, which is a delicacy to them, we cannot export it. We have trouble getting a certificate. So you can get a pretty decent price for this. Uh, oh yes, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. Yep. You're not going to tell me this is cod too, are you? Yes, it is. Yeah? It is cod, and uh, you can taste it there. Whoa. Okay. Incredibly sweet. Yes, it? it is sweet. See the uh, little people, in, little uh, children in Japan? Yeah. On recess, instead of having uh, candy bars, well, they eat that. Now, if, as Monsieur Guerin suggests, the cod is the pig of the sea, we can't very well throw away his skin, can we? No, sir. We'll take the skin here, to the home of Madame Irma Bouget. This is a jewelry mm -hmm. holder. This is a jewelry cravate qui est, qui n'est pas complètement terminée. This is a, um, Avec le nœud pressé. a tie which is not uh, completed completely uh, finished up yet. Voilà. Ici, c'est dans ce sont des porte monnaies avec des montures en écaille. This is a coin purse. Amazing, isn't it? And through her work, Madame Bouget has created a full-time job for herself. Are you kept busy every day? Is it a year-long thing for you? Est-ce que vous êtes occupé continuellement avec personne? Oui, parce que je fais le tonnage. Yes. 
je tanne et puis je confectionne, je crée mes modèles moi-même. Yes, she's busy all the time because she has to do the tanning of the cod skins, which she does in her basement, uh, first of all. Then she has to uh, design her own models of what will sell and find the articles that will go along with it. Then she has to do the actual physical work. It's her little cottage industry that, she, that she's busy at all the time. Impressed? So are we. Let's go now to one more really interesting spot, a little building where Bernard Patterell turns out some of the most famous smoked salmon in the world. And here's the clincher, it's our salmon. He buys Newfoundland salmon and beats us at our own game. His secret, Monsieur Patterell puts only top quality salmon through his smokehouse. The knock against our salmon has been poor quality. We put a second rate fish through the smokehouse and expect a first class product to come out at the other end. And just how famous is Monsieur Patterell's smoked salmon? Well, it's on the menu of the Elysee Palace in Paris. How's that? Our uh, own production, one of the prime ministers of France, came to St. Pierre on visit and then uh, tasted in here and said, uh, well, then that's the kind of smoked salmon I want to see on my table. And now uh, the prime ministers of uh, France has been uh, purchasing some of that salmon since. So even though the prime ministers change occasionally, your market doesn't? Well, I, you know, I hope uh, even with the, uh, the politics and uh, the event of the uh, any political events, I, I hope the, still the Prime Minister of France is still going to have his uh, supply of our own smoked salmon. What makes your salmon so good? Well, I would say uh, there, is, there is a few personal recipes, but uh, I would say to get a, uh, the best smoked salmon, you must start first with the best quality salmon and then you must absolutely, absolutely you must uh, take the great care to the process of the salmon itself. Now there is a Newfoundland connection here, isn't there? Some of your salmon comes from the island. I would say uh, most of our salmon uh, comes from uh, Newfoundland and or Labrador, but uh, they were purchased on, on, uh, in Newfoundland. The people of Saint-Pierre are fiercely loyal to France. But they've shown in the past they won't take any guff. A couple of years ago, an angry mob literally hauled away the chief government official and threw him off the island. Before he knew it, he was put on a boat and dispatched to Paris. He wasn't even given time to say goodbye to his wife. For the most part, however, Saint Pierre is a pretty quiet spot. Other than the occasional flare up, the Saint Pierre mind their own business and stay out of the headlines except, of course, when they're inadvertently dragged into the limelight. Case in point, France recently got the right to operate factory freezer trawlers, but Saint Pierre is worried about FFTs, worried for the same reason we fought them here in Newfoundland. They're afraid of losing jobs on shore. And on the question of Canada's 200-mile limit, France and Saint Pierre aren't exactly at odds, but their positions are different. Both are arguing historical fishing rights, but that's where the similarity ends. Here's why. Right now, the people of Saint-Pierre can only fish within a 12-mile limit. They say it's not enough, because the inshore fishery is gone, and they must fish offshore to survive. So they want a chunk of the 200-mile limit along part of their own coastline. France, on the other hand, is fighting for a much larger piece of the action, overlapping into Canadian waters. The people of Saint-Pierre will tell you all they want is enough to support their own population, that they're simply caught in the middle between France and Canada. Now that's their position. We'll leave it to you to judge if it's valid or not. One thing though, there's no disputing. In many ways, the people of Saint-Pierre are very much like ourselves. How else could they have survived for so long, all by themselves, out there in the middle of the hostile North Atlantic? Bonsoir, good night.